بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا طيب with the kitab Zahad al-Mustaqni' the book of Zahad al-Mustaqni' of Imam al-Hajjawi رحمه الله last time we spoke about Arafat uh, the standing of Arafat that was the last thing we spoke about in the text and today with Allah's permission we continue from where the Imam he said where he said ثُمَّ يَدْفَعُ بَعْدَ الْمَغْرِبِ إِلَى مُزْدَلِفَ بِالسَّكِينَةِ so المستحب أن يدفع الناس بعد غروب الشمس كاملة مع دفع الإمام that the recommended thing is that the people they go after Maghrib towards Muzdalifa the author he says إِلَى مُزْدَلِفَ بِالسَّكِينَةِ to Muzdalifa بِالسَّكِينَةِ go to Muzdalifa with tranquility Muzdalifa al-Mash'ar al-Ma'roof bi Makkah Muzdalifa is the gathering place uh, well known in Makkah Mawtin Mubid al-Hajj wa majma'ahum idha sadaru min arafat It's the place where the Hajj is going to rest for the night and they're going to gather when they come from Arafat wa tusamma jam'an li istima' al-Nas biha and it's given the name of jam'an of gathering due to the obvious fact that people gather there فَسُنَّ فِي النَّفْرَةِ مِنْ عَرَفَةِ إِلَى مُزْدَلِفَةِ So the sunnah in going from Arafah to Muzdalifa أَنْ يَكُونَ ذَلِكَ بِالسَّكِينَةِ is that that should be done with tranquility كما فعل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم as the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did so حديث بخاري في ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما where he said ابن عباس said أنه دفع مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يوم عرفة فسمع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وراءه زجرا شديدا وضربا وصوتا للإبل the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on his way from Arafah to Muzdalifah he heard lots of noise behind him the Prophet and the, the sound of the camels etc the sound of the people making lots of noise so the Prophet with his whip pointed towards them الناس, O people upon you is to have tranquility for verily righteousness is not in Ida and Ida is a darb a sariya. Ida is to walk or to rush quickly to where you are going to. So here the Prophet is telling the people that on their way to Muzdalifa they should be in calmness and tranquility. The author Al Hajjawi he says, Wa yusri'u fi fajwa fil fajwati. The person or the people, if they see a gap, then they speed up. The evidence is in the hadith of Bukhari Muslim, the hadith of Usama, وَكَانَ الرَّدِيفَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَمْ مِنْ عَرَفَ إِلَى مُزْدَلِفَةِ Usama رضي الله عنه was behind the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on his way to Muzdalifa. هِنَا سَأَلُوهُ الْمَسِيرِهِ مِنْ عَرَفَ إِلَى مُزْدَلِفَةِ And they asked, they asked uh, this companion Usama, how was the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم traveling from Arafah to Muzdalifa? So he said, كَانَ يَسِيرُ الْعَنَقْ فَإِذَا وَجَدَ فَجْوَةَ النص that the Prophet ﷺ will anaq al-sayr bil-i'tidal wa nassu al-isra qalilan that the Prophet ﷺ kana yasir al-anaq that the Prophet ﷺ when he would go he would travel in a in a controlled manner he would be traveling to Muzdalifah in a controlled manner and if he found a space in front of him fajwatan nass and al-nass al-isra qalil is to speed up a little bit so when the person finds space in front of them on their way to Muzdalifah, they can speed up a little bit, but they should keep the tranquility about them. The author, he says, وَيَجْمَعُ بِهَا بَيْنَ الْإِشَاعِينَ uh, When they get to Muzdalifah, they should pray the Maghrib and the Isha. Sheikh Mansour, he says, أَسُنَّ أَنْ يُصَلِّ فِي الْمُزْدَلِفَةِ الْمَغْرِبِ وَالْإِشَاءَ جَمَعْ تَأْخِيرِ بِأَذَانٍ وَاحِدْ وَإِقَامَتَيْنِ that the sunnah when you get to Muzdalifah is to pray Maghrib and Isha and Jama'at Ta'akhir meaning that you pay Maghrib in the time of Isha with one Adhan and two Iqama and Iqama for each Salah but only one Adhan wa sunnah an yusalli al-Maghrib thumma yahat rahlahu thumma yusalli al-Isha and the sunnah is that the person he prays Maghrib and then he takes down his belongings and he settles himself in his tent or wherever and then he goes ahead and he prays Isha and the dalil, the evidence for this is the hadith of Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu anhu in Bukhari and Muslim فَلَمَّا جَاءَ الْمُزْدَلَفَ نَزَلَ فَتَوَضَّعَ So when the Prophet sallallahu came, came to Muzdalifa he descended from his camel and made wudu فَأَسْبَغَ الْوُدُوءَ And he perfected his wudu 
ثم أقيمت الصلاة فصلى المغرب and then the iqamah was given for the maghrib and he prayed maghrib ثم أناخ كل إنسان بعيره في منزله then every person they tied and they brought their camel down uh, at their uh, respective places ثم أقيمت الإشاء فصلى ولم يصلي بينهما and then the Aisha uh, iqamah was given and the Prophet Sallallahu prayed that and he didn't pray between the Maghrib and the Isha. So in this hadith, what I've read to you, Shaykh Masul, he quotes it to explain the point that the people after having prayed Maghrib, they tie up their camels if they're riding camels, they take off their, um, the de- <coughs> they take off their, the goods that they were carrying with them and they settle into their tents and into their places for the night. The author, he says, وَيَبِيتُ بِهَا and the people they sleep there in the night of Muzdalifa. They stay there the night of Muzdalifa. Sheikh Mansur he says, "Ida sallal al-Maghrib wal-Isha bi Muzdalifa, fa inna hu yabitu biha laila al-Nahar." Once the people have prayed Maghrib and Isha, then they stay the night there, the night of Eid, laila al-Nahar. Wahad al-Mabit wajib, and this staying in Muzdalifa for the night is wajib. Is obligatory and the hadith, the hadith in that Imam Ahmed collected and Imam Abu Dawood collected from Urwa Ibn Mudarris radiallahu anhu who said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who said Man adraka ma'ana hadhi salah Whoever has caught this salah with us meaning in Muzdalifa ay al-Muzdalifa wa ata arafat qabla thalik and he came to Arafah the plain of Arafah before that laylan aw naharan during the night or the day فَقَدْ تَمَّ حَجْهُهُ فَقَدْ تَمَّ حَجْهُهُ وَقَدَ تَفَثُهُ and then the person has completed his hajj and the rites that were upon him فَمَفْهُومُهُ so the understanding of this Sheikh Mansour says أَنَّ مَنْ لَمْ يُبِتْ بِمُزْدَلِفَ فَإِنَّ حَجْهُ لَمْ يَتِمْ that whoever didn't spend the night in Muzdalifa then his hajj has not been complete وَعَلَيْهِ أَنْ يُجْبِرَ حَجْهُ بِالدَّمٍ وَجُوبًا and it's upon him that he corrects the mistake of not having spent the night in Muzdalifa by, sac- by giving the dam, which is wajib, giving the um, sacrifice, which is wajib, as a penalty. Because the Prophet spent the night there in Muzdalifa and said, in the hadith which we've quoted often, that I am doing these actions, the Prophet ﷺ, in the various places of Hajj, he did actions and he said, I'm doing this so that you can take from me your rights, meaning learn how to do the rights of Hajj and Umrah. The author, he said, And it's allowed for the person, if he wishes to, to leave Muzdalifa after half of the night has passed. Sheikh Mansur, he says, للحاج أن يخرج من مزدلفة بعد مضي نصف الليل It's permissible for the person to leave after half the night has passed. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ النَّاسِ تِجَاهِ الْمُبِيتِ بمزدلفة لا يخلون من حالين That people with regards to their stay in مزدلفة are either one or two situations. Number one, الضعفة من النساء والصبيان The weak from the, um, from the women and the children والمرضى ونحوهم and the sick people and those that are similar to him. وَمَنْ يَقُومُ عَلَيْهِمْ And those that are taking care of these weak people. So this group, فَهَاؤُلَاءِ يَجُوزَ لَهُمْ أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْ مُزْدَلِفَةً إِذَا ذَهَبَ مُنْتَصِفُ الليل. So this group of people, it's allowed for them to leave Muzdalifah if half the night has passed. So the second category, الْأَقْوِيَا Those who have strength. فَهَاؤُلَاءِ يَسُنَّ لَهُمْ So these, the sunnah for them, أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْ مُزْدَلِفَةً before the sun rises but after having prayed Fajr and after the uh, the sun or the horizon has become yellow كَمَا سَيَعْتِي as we will explain a bit later وَيَجُوزَ لَهُمْ أَدُفْعُ بَعْدَ الطُّلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ and it's permissible for them to go after the Fajr has been prayed بعد الطلوع الفجر or after the dawn has broken so it's permissible for them to go after the dawn has broken the group that are known as the strong people those who have strength and ability to stay. The author he says, وَقَبْلَهُ فِيهِ دَمْ And if a person leaves before leaves Muzdalifa before having spent half the night, then he has to again pay a penalty, he has to pay dam. Sheikh Mansur he says, إِذَا دَفْعَ الْإِنسَانِ الْحَاجِ قَبْلَ الْوَقْتِ If the person leaves before the time, 
فإن عليه دم then he has to pay the penalty لأنه ترك واجب because he left an obligation ويستوي في ذلك الجاهل والناس والعالم and it's all the same whether the person was an ignorant person of the ruling or he was forgetful or he knew about the ruling لأنه واجب فلا يؤذر بتركه because it is an obligation and it is not overlooked due to any of these excuses والعلة and the reasoning أن مبيت كل الليل that the staying in مزدلفة should be all of the night أو أكثره واجب or, all, or most of the night is واجب either to stay the whole night or most of the night is واجب وكلاهما مفقود في من ذكر and, and these situations is of course absent in the situations that we've mentioned meaning that the one who doesn't spend at least most of the night half of the night or all of the night then he's, then he's from those who's going to have to pay the penalty فَيَكُونُ تَارِكًا لِلْمَبِيتِ بِهَا فَيَجِبِ عَلَيْهِ دَمْ وَلِتَرْكِ الْوَاجِبِ فِي الْحَجِ so this person that didn't spend half the night at least or most of the night then this person is from those who has to pay a penalty because he left one of the obligations of the Hajj. وَأَمَّا مَنْ دَفَعَ بَعْضَ نِصْفِ اللَّيْلِ فَلَا شَيْءَ عَلَيْهِ As for the one who leaves after half the night has passed and there's nothing upon him. لِأَنَّهُ بَاتْ مُعْظَمَ اللَّيْلِ Because he stayed at night most of the night. وَحُكْمُ الْمُعْظَمْ حُكْمُ الْكُلْ And the ruling of uh, most is given the ruling of all. Meaning that if you spend most of the night, it's as though you spent all of the night. فَلَمْ يَكُنْ تَارِكًا لِلْوَاجِبِ So the person has not left a wajib in this situation. كَوَصُولِهِ إِلَيْهَا بَعْدَ الْفَجْرِ لَا قَبْلَهُ Like he arrived to Muzdalifah after Fajr, not before it. Sheikh Mansour explains, A كَذَلِكَ يَلْزِمُهُ دَمْ يَلْزِمُهُ دَمٌ إِذَا وَصْلَ مُزْدَلِفَ بَعْدَ طُلُوءِ الْفَجْرِ Likewise, the person has to pay a penalty if he gets to Muzdalifa after dawn break, after Fajr. لِأَنَّ وَقْتُ الْمَبِيدِ إِنْتَهَى بِطُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ Because the time that where he was required as a wajib to stay in Muzdalifa has now gone after the dawn break, after Fajr, طُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ So وَإِنْ كَانَ تَأَخُرُهُ بِعُدْرِ So whether the person came late to Muzdalifa due to excuse, كَشِدَّةِ الْزِحَامِ like um, lots of congestion and traffic or he lost his way and something similar to that or he didn't have an excuse then this person he will have to pay the dumb he will have to pay the penalty because he came late he came after the specified designated time to Muzdalifa Sheikh Mansur carries on and he says because these people they left now a wajib so it's imperative upon them that they pay the dam, they pay the penalty however if a person gets to Muzdalifah before Fajr even if that be just a few moments then there's nothing upon him and it will suffice the person that he stays there for just a short duration of time and then he leaves The author he says, فَإِذَا صَلَّ الصُّبْحِ أَتَى الْمَشْعَرَ الْحَرَامِ أَتَى الْمَشْعَرَ الْحَرَامِ فَرَقَاهُ That when the person has prayed the Fajr, then he moves on to the Mash'ar al-Haram and he climbs it. أَوْ يَقِفُ إِنْدَهُ Or he stands at its place. وَيَحْمُدُ اللَّهُ وَيُكَبِّرُهُ And then he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he makes takbir for the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَيَقْرَأُ and he reads the surah, the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ And if you have left Arafat, then glorify and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the place known as Mash'ar al-Haram. So he reads the end of these two ayat وَيَدْعُوا حَتَّى يُسْفِرَ And he makes dua until the sun has risen. So Shaykh Mansur, he says, As-Sunnah fi Muzdalifah the Sunnah in Muzdalifa and Yubakir bi Salat al Fajr yom al Eid is that the person makes Salat al Fajr early as possible on the day of Eid. Fi awl al Waqt in the first of its time. Due to the hadith of Ibn Masood radiallahu anhu, which stated, Ma ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salla salatan illa li miqatiha illa salatain. I've only ever seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibn Masood said, pray within the correct times of the Salah 
or within the timings of the Salah except for two Salahs. Salat al-Maghrib wal isha bi jam'ah. That Salat al-Maghrib al isha when he was making uh, at the place of jam'ah, at the place of Muzdalifah. Meaning Salat al-Maghrib and Salat al isha was delayed slightly. Not delayed beyond their fixed times, but delayed slightly. وَصَلَّ الْفَجَرْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ قَبْلَ مِيقَاتِهَا And he prayed Fajr on that day of Muzdalifah, meaning on the morning of Eid, uh, as early as possible. قَبْلَ مِيقَاتِهَا doesn't mean before its time, it means he prayed it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as early as possible. So Shaykh Masur he carries on, he says, وَبَعْدَ مَا يُصَلِّ الْفَجْرِ يُسَنْ لَهُ أَنْ يَقِفَ عِنْدَ مَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ After the person has prayed Fajr on the day uh, from at Muzdalifah, it's, um, it's recommended for him to stand at Mash'ar al-Haram. Okay? Sorry, so he prays Fajr at the Mash'ar al-Haram. وَالْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ جَبْلُ الْمَعْرُوفِ فِي مُزْدَلِفَةِ and the Mash'ar al-Haram is a mountain which is well known in Muzdalifa. وَفِيهِ الْآنِ مَسْجِدٌ يُسَمَّ مَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ And there is now there a masjid given the name of Mash'ar al-Haram. فَسُنَّةً يَأْتِ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ So the Sunnah is that the person comes to the Mash'ar al-Haram وَيَقِفُ إِنْدَهُ And he stands there. أَوْ يَرْقَى الْجَبَلْ Or he climbs the mountain. وَيَدُ اللَّهُ وَيَذْكُرُهُ وَيَقْرَى And he, uh, he calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he remembers him by uh, extolling his virtues. And then he recites the two verses from Surah Al-Baqarah. لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَّحٌ أَنْ تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ وَاذْكُرُوهُ كَمَا حَدَاكُمْ وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الضَّالِّينَ ثم أفيد من حيث أفاد الناس واستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم. So he recites these verses there. حتى تصفر السماء until the sky has become yellowish due to the sun rising. ثم ينطلق قبل طلوع الشمس and then he leaves that place before the sun has risen. And the evidence for this is in the hadith of Sahih Muslim of Jabir رضي الله عنه. Where he said about the Prophet ﷺ, ثم ركب القصوى. The Prophet ﷺ then rode his camel قصوى حتى أتى المشعر الحرام until he came to the مشعر الحرام فاستقبل القبلة فدعاه وكبره وحلله ووحده. So he faced the qibla, the Prophet ﷺ, and he made dua and he made takbir and he made tahlil and he made praising of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. فلم يزل واقفا حتى أسفر حتى أسفر جدا. And the Prophet ﷺ continued doing that, making dua and extolling the virtues of Allah through dhikr until the sky, the horizon became very yellow. And then the Prophet ﷺ left that place uh, before the sun had risen. The author he says, فَإِذَا بَلَغَ مُحَصِّرًا أَصْرَعَ رَمْيَةَ حَجْرٍ When the person reaches the place called Muhassir, he speeds up for the distance of a stone's throw. He speeds up for the duration of the distance of a stone's throw. إِذَا تَحَرَكَ مِنْ مُزْدَلِفَةً مُتَّجِهًا إِلَى مِنَا If the person leaves from Muzdalifa now going on towards Al-Minna فَإِنَّهُ يَعْتَرِضُهُ وَادِيَ وَادِ مُحَسِّرٍ Then the person is going to come across the valley of Muhassir. وَهُوَ وَادٍ بَيْنَ مُزْدَلِفَ وَمِنَا And it is a valley which is between Muzdalifa and Mina. فَإِذَا وَصَلَهُ فَإِنَّهُ يُسْرُعْ إِنْ كَانَ مَاشًا أَوْ رَاكِبًا And when the person gets to it, he races uh, for the duration of a stone's throw, which some people, I believe, they said is about um, 500 arms length. Okay, he, he rushes as much as he can for that distance, uh, if he's walking or if he's riding. And some of the ulama, they mentioned one of the reasons that the Prophet ﷺ might have done this is because of the fact that this is where the Ashab al-Fil, the people of the Fil in Surah al-Fil were punished. Tayyip. So of course when you're in a place of punishment, you don't stay there taking pictures. You move by as quick as you can. The author, he says, al hasa, And the person takes the stones. يَجُزُ الْإِنسَانِ أَنْ يَأْخُذُ الْحَصَى لِلْرَمِّ مِنْ أَيِّ مَكَانٍ شَاءٍ Sheikh Mansour says it's permissible for the person to take the stones from any place that he wishes. لكن المذهب, however, in the madhab, أن الأفضل أن تكون من مزدلفة. That it's recommended and better that the person takes these stones from the place of مزدلفة on his way when he's leaving. 
And the number of the stones that the person should take is 70 between the size of a hemus, a chickpea, or a bunduk. A bunduk is that which is used as a pellet to shoot birds. Adul al hasa sab'un. So the number is 70. Sab'un li yawm al nahar. Seven that you will use for stoning on the day of Eid. Wa thalathun wa sittun li ayyam al tashriq al thalatha. And uh, 63 for the other days of the tashriq, of the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. In lam yata'ajjal. If the person doesn't leave on the 12th. If the person leaves on the 12th, then it only needs 49 stones instead of um instead of 70 stones wa amma al-miqdar al-hasa fa hiya hasa sighar bayna al-himsa wal bundqa so as we said the size of the uh, stone is been between the size of a chickpea or a pellet that is used to shoot at pigeons imam al-hakim in his al-mustadrak he narrates from ibn abbas radiyallahu anhu about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam أنه التقط من حصل خضفي فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمثال هؤلاء فرمو that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he picked up stones which were the size of a fingertip or less and he said the like of these you should use to throw the author he said فإذا وصل إلى منا وهي من وادي محسر إلى جمرة الأقبة رماها that when the person he reaches the place known as منا and it starts from the wadi, the value of muhassir, up until Jamrat al aqaba Then the person, he throws the stones when he gets to the Jamrat al aqaba when he gets to the large pillar known as Jamrat al aqaba Sheikh Masul says, إِذَا وَصَلَ إِلَى مِنَا فَصُنَّ أَنْ يَبْدَأَ أَوْلًا بِرَمِّ Jamrat al aqaba When the person reaches the place of Mina, the sunnah is that they first start, the first thing they do is the stoning, seven stones, of uh, Jabrat al Aqaba, Wahiya Tahiya to Mina, and it is like the Tahiya of Mina. Like we have a Tahiya to Masjid, this is the Tahiya of Mina. Fala Yabda Ubi Shay in Kablahu is Tahbaban. So it's recommended that the person doesn't begin with anything except this action, that the first thing that he does in Mina is that he does the stoning of the pillar. Bisabi Hasayatin Mutaqabat Mutaqabat. He throws seven stones consecutively one after the other. Sheikh Mansur, Tariqatul Rami, the way of throwing, number one, and Yarmiha Bisabi Hasayat, that he should throw seven stones. Wala Yazid Wala Yankus, and he shouldn't increase upon seven, nor should he decrease. Bil Ijma', and there is consensus upon this mentioned by Imam Al Nawi in Al Majmu and others. لفعل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما في حديث جابر due to the action of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in the hadith of Sahih Muslim from Jabir رضي الله عنه فرماها بسبع حسيات so the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم threw at جمرة الأقبة seven stones يكبر مع كل حصات منها and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم each time he threw a stone he would make تكبير second point to mention يرميها متعاقبات that the person throws them consecutively واحدا بعد واحد واحدة بعد واحدة so if the, pers- the person has to throw one after the other فلو رمها دفعة واحدة لم تجزئه إلا عن واحدة and if the person threw all seven in one throwing all seven in one throwing this would only be counted for him as one stone لأنه صلى الله عليه وسلم رمى سبع رميات because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم threw seven uh, separate consecutive throwings and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you should take from me how to do the rites and rituals of the Hajj likewise if the person was to drop the stones rather than throw the stones he was just to place the stones at the Jabrat uh, al-Aqaba then this also wouldn't be counted as throwing because the person hasn't thrown the author he says يرفع يده حتى يرى بياض عبته ويكبر مع كل حصاتن that the person he throws and he, he raises his hand to the extent that his armpits can be seen when he's throwing and he makes takbir with every stone that he's throwing 
So Sheikh Mansour, he mentions that أَنْ يَرْفَعَ يَدَهُ حَالَ الرَّمِي That the person has to raise his hands when he's throwing. Or he should, it's recommended. لِأَنَّهُ أَعْوَنْ لَهُ عَلَى الرَّمِي Because it's more helpful for him and it's easier for him to do throwing by raising the, the hand up high. لَكِنْ رَفَ الْيَدْ لَيْسَ بِشَرْطِ However, raising the hand is not a condition. إِنَّمَا شَرْطْ أَنْ يَرْمِيهَا رَمْيًا Verily, what is the condition is to ensure that it is a type of throwing. Even if it's not by raising the hand high, you could throw from chest height if you wish to do so. More difficult, but your throwing would still be valid because it's considered throwing. Also to consider, يُكَبِّرُ مَعَ كُلِّ حَصَاتٍ That the person makes a takbir with every stone that he throws. وَهَذَا سُنَّةٍ This is sunnah due to the hadith of Jabir. فَرَمَّاهَا بِسَبْعِ حَصَيَاتٍ يُكَبِّرُ مَعَ كُلِّ حَصَاتٍ مِنْهَا That the Prophet ﷺ threw the stones and at each stone that he threw, he made a takbir. وَلِيَأْنَا رَمِّ وَغَيْرِهِ مِنْ مَنَاسِكِ الْحَجِ And because the throwing of the stones at the pillars and other rituals from the rituals of the Hajj إِنَّمَا هِيَ إِقَامَةٌ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Verily it is establishing the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala كَمَّا فِي الْحَدِيثِ As is mentioned in a hadith. Shaykh Mansouri says وَلَا يُجْزِئُ رَمِّيُ بِغَيْرِهَا And throwing other than the stones is not going to be accepted as valid. Sheikh Mansour says, المعتبر في الرمي هو الحصى The, the um, considered or the valid throwing is to throw the stones. فَلَوْ رَمَّ بِغَيْرِهَا So if a person threw other than stones كَالنَّعَالْ وَالْأَخْشَابْ وَنَحْوِهَا Like for example throwing uh, sandals, some crazy people do that, or throwing uh, pieces of wood or anything of that nature فَلَا يُجْزِئْ Then this would not be valid. وَلَوْ كَانَ الْمَرْمِ به ولو كان المرمي به غاليا كالذهب والجواهر even if it be that the thing that is being thrown is valuable extremely valuable like pieces of gold or jewels even then it would not be valid only stones the author he says ولا بها ثانيا ولا بها ثانيا nor is it permissible to throw them again لو رمى بحصات فلا يجزء أن يرمي بها مرة أخرى so if the person throws the stones but then gathers those stones somehow and throws them again, then these are not valid. Meaning that you cannot use a stone that has already been used for throwing. وذلك لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لم يأخذ حصى من المرمى and that is because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't take uh, stones from the pillar. He never collected any stones that had been thrown from the pillar. وقياسا على الماء المستعمل المستعمل في الوضوء الواجب and uh, making قياس making analogy upon water which has been used in making obligatory wudu so we know that in the madhab that if somebody makes water if makes wudu with obligatory wudu that which drops off from his body if it was to be collected that water cannot be used to make wudu likewise with these stones once these stones have been thrown in the obligatory throwing they cannot be collected and then used again for another throwing or to complete the throwing. The author he says, وَلَا يَقِفُوا And the person after having thrown the Jamrat al-Aqaba, he doesn't stand there. إِذَا رَمَّ Jamrat al-Aqaba فَلَا يَقِفْ إِنْدَهَا لِلْدُعَى بَلْ يَنْصَرِفْ If the person has thrown at the Jamrat al-Aqaba, at the pillar, he doesn't stand there making dua, rather he just leaves. So Shaykh Muhtar Qajasr, he said, if the person does so, it's not haram, however it's not sunnah. It's something that you should avoid. In Bukhari ibn Umar, he said, about the Prophet ﷺ, ثم يرمي جمرة ذات العقبة من بطن الوادي. And then they, then the Prophet ﷺ, he threw the stones at the Jamrat al-Aqaba from the from the valley. ولا يقف عندها. And the person doesn't stand there. ثم ينصرف. The Prophet ﷺ didn't stand at the pillar after throwing. He moved on. And Ibn Umar, he said, هكذا رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يفعله. He said, this is how I saw the Prophet ﷺ do it. Meaning that after throwing the stones at the Jamrat al-Aqaba, the Prophet ﷺ didn't stand to make dua, rather he moved on from that place. وَسُنَّ فِي مِكَانِ الرَّمِي And the sunnah with regards to where you stand for the rami, أَنْ يَجْعَلْ مَكَّةَ أَنْ يَصَارِهِ is to put Makkah on your left, وَمِنَا أَنْ يَمِينِهِ and Mina on your right, وَيَسْتَقْبِلِ الْقِبْلَةَ and facing the qibla. وَهَذَا الَّذِي فَعَلَهُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم And this is what the Prophet ﷺ did, as mentioned in Bukhari. The author he says, وَيَقْتَعُ تَلْبِيَةَ قَبْلَهَا And the person, 
he stops the talbiyah before getting to the or before doing the throwing at Jamrat al Aqaba. Yadal al Muharim yulabbi fi jami'i ma mada mi manasak al Hajj. Sheikh Mansur says that the Muharim, the one who is doing the Hajj in the Ihram, state of Ihram, he is continually doing the talbiyah throughout the whole of his Hajj until this point where he comes to the Jamrat al Aqaba. Wala yaqta' talbiyata illa bi shuru'i fi rammi Jamrat al Aqaba. He only stops the talbiyah. Labaik Allahumma labaik when he comes to the Jamrat al Aqaba. Okay? And the evidence is in the hadith of Bukhari Muslim of uh, Al Fadl ibn Abbas that he said that the Prophet وسلم, and the Nabi وسلم, Lam Yazal Yulabi Hatta Balag al Jamra that the Prophet وسلم, continued to make the talbiyah up until he came to the Jamrat al Aqaba. The author he says, Wa Yarmi Ba'da Tulu al Shams and the person throws the stones after the sun has risen. Al-Mustahab fi waqti rami Jamrat al-Aqaba. Sheikh Mansur says the recommended time for throwing stones at Jamrat al-Aqaba an yakuna min ba'di talu'i shams is that on the day of Eid, al-Adha, yawm al-Nahar, that this takes place after the sun has risen. Lifa'li Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam due to the action of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Sahih al-Muslim because Jabir said, Rama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at Jamrat al-Yawm al-Nahri al-Duha that the Prophet وسلم, he threw the stones at Jamrat al-Aqaba at the time of Duha, which is after the sun has risen. بعدو, as for other than the day of Nahar, فَإِذَا زَالَتِ الشَّمْسِ The Prophet وسلم, would throw on the 11th, the 12th and the 13th, once the sun had passed the meridian, the mid of the sky. The author he says, بعد نصف الليل, And it's permissible to throw the stones after midnight. يَبْدَأُ وَقْتُ الرَّمِي مِنْ بِذَاتِ الْوَقْتِ النَّفِرَى مِنْ مُزْدَلِفَى so Sheikh Mansur he says that the time of throwing the stone starts from the time the person has left Musdalifa, right? Which is after half of the night has passed uh, of the night of Musdalifa. So the person could start to in fact throw the stones if he somehow gets there uh, very quickly after leaving uh, Musdalifa after half of the night. The timing starts from half of the night. Now. ثُمَّ يَنْحَرُوا حَدْيًا إِنْ كَانَ مَعْهُ And then after having thrown the stones at Jamrat al-Aqaba, the person, he slaughters the animal, if the animal is with him, the sacrificial hadi that he has to give, he slaughters that if the animal is with him. Sheikh Mansur says, إِذَا فَرَغَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ رَمِي فَإِنَّهُ يَتَّجِهُ وَيَنْحَرْ حَدْيَهُ إِنْ كَانَ مَعْهُ That the person, if he finishes the throwing of the Jamrat al-Aqaba, then he slaughters his animal if it is with him or يذهب ويشتريه or he goes off and he buys one وهذا هو المشروع في الحد الواجب كونه بعد الرمي and this is what is recommended and legislated pertaining to the sacrificing of the animal is that it be done after the rami after the stoning of the Jamrat al-Aqaba and the evidence in the hadith of Sahih Muslim رمى من بطل الوادي ثم انصرف إلى ملحر that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after he had thrown uh, Jamrat al-Aqaba at Jamrat al-Aqaba, then he went on to the slaughter place. فَنَحَرَ ثَلَاثًا وَسِتِّينَ بِيَدِهِ Then the Prophet ﷺ slaughtered uh, 63 camels, I believe, uh, with his own hand. ثُمَّ عَطَى عَلِيًّا فَنَحَرَ مَا غَبَرْ And then he gave it to Ali radiallahu anhu to complete that which was left over. So of course in today's day and age, the slaughter is going to be arranged as part of your tour package and your guide or your hotel or your tour package will let you know uh, when this has been done. Otherwise, if it's not part of your package, you will go and purchase a coupon for the slaughter to be done on your half or for you to be able to do it yourself. The author, he says, And then the person goes ahead and cuts, he shaves or he cuts from his hair, all of his hair. Sheikh Masood says, إِذَا فَرَغَ مِنْ رَبِّ الْجَمَرَاتِ وَمِنْ نَحْرِ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ النَّحْرِ If the person has finished and completed throwing the stones at the Jamara, from the Jamarat, Jamarat al-Aqaba, وَمِنْ نَحْرِ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ النَّحْرِ And from slaughtering if he has slaughtered upon him. وَالَّذِي عَلَيْهِ نَحْرٌ هُوَ الْقَارِنْ وَالْمُتَّمَتِّعِ And the one who has to slaughter is the Qarin and the Mutamatti, the one who is doing Hajj al-Qiran and Hajj al-Tamatti. فَإِنَّهُ يَحْلِقْ شَعْرَهُ أَوْ يُقَصِّرْهُ then verily the person shaves his head or he shortens 
he trims his hair. وَيَجْعَلْ ذَلِكَ بَعْدَ الرَّمِّ وَالنَّحَرِ And he does his shaving of the head or his trimming of the hair after having done the slaughtering. كَمَا فَعْلَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَهُوَ مُخَيِّرْ بَيْنَ الْحَلْقِ وَالتَّقْسِيرِ And the person is, has the choice between either shaving his hair or cutting his hair. لِأَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ دَعَ لَهُمَا Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made dua for both as in the hadith. Uh, لكن الحلق أفضل However, to cut, to shave the hair is better ولذلك قدمه المصنف And that's why the Musannif, the author, he mentioned shaving before cutting And in the hadith of Bukhari Muslim, the hadith of Abi Huraira رضي الله عنه The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Allah مغفر للمحلقين أو الله forgive those who have shaved their hair Meaning have mercy upon them due to this action قالوا وللمقصرين The Sahaba said Ya Rasulullah make dua even for those who are cutting their hair the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma gfil al-muhalliqeen. Again, the Prophet repeated, oh Allah forgive those who have shaved their hair. Again, the Sahaba said, walil muqassirin. Also, Ya Rasulullah, for those who are cutting their hair. Qalaha thalath. The Prophet ﷺ repeated it three times. And then after the third time, he said, walil muqassirin. And then also for those who are cutting their hair. So clearly from the hadith, the preferred act is that the, that the person shaves their hair rather than cutting their hair. وَلِلْتَقْدِيمَ الْمُحَلِّقِينَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ فِي قَوْلِهِ And also مُحَلِّقِينَ Those who shave their hair were mentioned in the Qur'an before those who cut their hair. In the surah مُحَلِّقِينَ رُؤُوسَكُمْ وَمُقَصِّرِينَ Okay. Uh, what surah is that? Surah Al-Muhammad, I believe. That um, it's, it's mentioned that the um, they're cutting, they're sh- shaving their hair and cutting their hair. So the shaving is mentioned in the Qur'an before the, the, the cutting of their hair. وَكَوْنُ الْحَلْقِ بَعْدَ النَّحَرِ هُوَ عَلَى الْإِسْتِحْبَابِ فِي حَقِّ الْمُتَّمَتِّعِ وَالْقَارِنِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَسُقُ الْحَدِي So with regards to the cutting of the hair after the sacrifice has been done, this is recommended pertaining to the one who's doing Hajj Tamatta' or Hajj Al-Qiran and if they didn't bring with them their sacrificial animal. وَعَلَى الْوَجُوبِ فِي حَقِّ الْقَارِنِ الَّذِي سَاقَ الْحَدِي كَمَا فَعْلَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, doing the uh, the shaving of the hair after the sacrifice is an obligate obligatory a uh, tartib obligatory order order of actions uh, if the qarin had brought with him the sacrificial animal kama fa'ala nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did like that so if somebody wants to cut the hair sheikh mutlaq jasri mentioned somebody cannot just cut their hair from different parts of their head rather it has to be cut from all of the hair if somebody wants to just cut the hair and not shave the hair, it has to be done from all over the head. The author, he says, وَتُقَصِّرُ مِنْهُ الْمَرْعَةُ الْمُلَةً That the woman, she only has to cut the amount of a uh, the tip of a finger. Okay, that's all she has to cut. الْمَرْعَةُ لَيْسَ لَهَا الْحَلْقِ بِإِجْمَعِ الْأُلَمَاء The woman, she doesn't have to shave, of course. Uh, and that is by the consensus of the ulama and the hadith in Abi Dawood Ibn Abbas in radiyallahu anhuma he said Laysa ala nisa'i halqun There's not upon women that they have to shave their head Innama ala nisa'i a taqseer Verily upon the women is that they just have to cut their hair Wa ala hadha fa tuqassir minhu qadr al-anmula Min al-isba' That the woman all she has to cut is the fingertip length Okay the fingertip length is what she has to cut means jamia shar la min ba'dihi however it has to be from all of her hair and not just from a part of it bi an taj'alahu dafa'il fa ta'khud min kulli dafira and the way that would be done is that the woman she would uh, they would be put in like what do you call them plaits okay or yeah the woman's hair would be gathered up and then trimmed that's how it would be gathered up from different parts of her head and then her hair would be trimmed to ensure that the trimming has taken place from all over her hair. ثُمَّ قَدْ حَلَّ لَهُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا النِّسَاءِ And then the تَحَلَّ الْأَوَّلِ What is mentioned as تَحَلَّ الْأَوَّلِ The first تَحَلَّ has been uh, achieved which is that the person is now free from the state of ihram and he can do everything that the person outside of the ihram can do outside of the state of ihram except to have relationship with women that comes after the tahallil athani the second tahallil Sheikh Mansour said idha faragha min rami if the person has now finished from throwing wal and from shaving or cutting the hair 
فإنه يكون قد حل له كل شيء من محظورات الإحرام إلا النساء. Then the person is now free from all of the restrictions of the ihram except for the women. In the hadith in Bukhari Muslim narrated by Aisha رضي الله عنها, she said, إذا رمى أحدكم جمرة العقبة فقد حل له كل شيء إلا النساء. That once you have once you have thrown stones at the جمرة العقبة, then you are now hell. You are now free from the state of ihram. From everything except for women. Dorothy says, والحلاق والتقصير والنسك And the حلاق and the تقصير are rights of hajj. Okay? So the cutting of the hair or the shaving of the hair is not in order to be free from the ihram. Rather, it is from the rights of hajj. It is from the things that you must do in the hajj. So it's not something which is specific to being freed from the ihram. Rather, they are separate rights of Hajj that must be fulfilled. The author he says, "ولا يلزم بتأخيره دم ولا بتقديمه على الرمي والنحر." And if the person was to delay the cutting of the hair, then there's no penalty to be there's no penalty upon him. Nor if the person was to do the cutting of the hair before uh, before stoning Jamrat al Aqaba and before the slaughtering. So if the person was to do it after or to do it before this, the, the, um, the stoning and the slaughtering, then there's no problem. Sheikh Masood says, يجوز للإنسان تأخير الحلق عن يوم النحر It's permissible for the person to delay his cutting of the hair or shaving of the hair to after the day of Eid. ولا يلزمه بتأخير دم And there's nothing upon him due to him delaying it. وكذا يجوز تقديم الحلق على رمي والنحر And likewise, it's also permissible for, for the person to do the um, to cut his hair before uh, the Jamrat al Aqaba, before pelting Jamrat al Aqaba, and before slaughtering. And the evidence is that a variety of ahadith where the Prophet وسلم, mentioned in his answers that things can be done out of order, that these things can be done out of the uh, stated order. For example, you have in Bukhari al Muslim, Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu said, Anna rajul qal ya Rasulullah. The bahtu qabla an ahliq, O Prophet of Allah, O Messenger of Allah, I have slaughtered before I cut my hair. So the Prophet said, Ahliq wa la haraj, go ahead, cut your hair, there's no problem. So in this situation, the person had slaughtered before he cut his hair. The Prophet said, go ahead and cut your hair, there's no problem. And then another person asked him, فقال, قبل أن أذبح. The, prof- the person said, I've cut my hair before I slaughtered. The Prophet ﷺ said, إذبح ولا حرج. Go ahead and can do the slaughtering. There's nothing upon you. Okay? Sheikh Mutalaq Jasr, he says, the actions of the day of Nahar, the actions that you do on the day of Eid, okay, are not, to, are not mash, mashrut. They're not conditioned to be in order. But it's better to do it in order, خُرُوجًا مِنَ الْخِلَافِ It's better to do it in order, as they came in the hadith, to come out of the difference of opinion. So as we mentioned, you can do, you know, cutting before the slaughtering or slaughtering before the cutting. It's not a problem. But if you do them in order, it's better for you. Khalas, inshallah, I think we'll stop here, inshallah, before moving on. And um, the next things that will be mentioned is after the person has reached Minna. What we spoke about is that the person went to Muzdalifa after uh, finishing Arafah. And then he went on to Minna. And at Mina, he did the throwing of the Jamrat al Aqaba, and then he cut his hair, and then he slaughtered, or he slaughtered, and then he cut his hair, depending upon how he did it. And then after that, the person is going to go on towards uh, the Bayt, uh, towards the Kaaba, to do the Tawaf. This is what we will speak about in the next session, inshallah. If you have any questions or corrections, then feel free. If not, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us immensely for this small effort and to accept it from us. Ameen.